Tutors, crypto, tutors, hey. It's a way. Making money in my sleep? Making money in my sleep. Boom! We're back at it. Another Crypto Couch episode produced by Crypto Tutors. We have one of the legends in the game. It's so awesome because you're not only a legend, you're alive. And most people don't become legends until, you know, their demise. And so to be with a living legend is always like, I don't know, legendary? <laughs> okay, so my name is Lisa Francoeur. I am one of the co-founders of Crypto Tutors. Crypto Tutors is where we help folks like you uh, simplify crypto. It's where we learn through e-learning, through um, tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, through edutainment programs like this, where we come in live, we're bringing the best in the game, which is why today we have as I said, a living legend, Mr. Miles Dotson. Hey, everybody. Miles, you know, Fancy Pies Energy is on 100,000 million always. And I just love how chill and easy and calm you are. So it's going to be very like yin yang. yang. <laughs> I'm a Zen master. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm waiting for you to start to levitate. <laughs> so, Miles, you know, I've known you for a while now, and there's just so many different, um, you know, there's so many different accolades for, for me to list in relation to what you've done over your career. But rather than hearing it from me, I would love for you to just highlight a few of the things that you want people to know about who Miles Dotson is. Yeah, sure. Uh, I was an undergraduate researcher for the National Science Foundation and the Ronald E. McNair Foundation. Um, I went from that into startups immediately straight out of college. Um, ended up in consulting. I built some really phenomenal software systems for the oil and gas industry to help them understand their, their histories and, uh, you know, realize that in the form of data. I uh, went into product management, uh, led enterprise and commercial software. And now I'm, you know, full time in the startup space on a different lens of venture, uh, trying to change the asset class for the better. Um, and so, uh, that's like 17 jobs that you just listed. So, uh, if I omitted a lot too. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Cause I was like, see, when I was trying to, um, articulate all that you are and all that you embody, it just was, it was too much for, for me to list. And so I'm really happy that you level set with, with our community around who you are, what you've done. And I'm going to level with you as well. When it comes to what brought us to today's conversation, which is, you know, crypto can be terrifying, right? Like when it comes to understanding the landscape, when it comes to applying your learning, which is, you know, part and parcel to what we're hoping to inspire people to do with crypto tutors, inspire them to take the education that they're acquiring through our courses, through the conversations they're having with their community and so forth, and apply those learnings to help drive wealth. And so I would love to hear from you, you know, I was terrified of crypto. I was out in these, you know, crypto streets like, ah, you know, thankfully I had access to people like you, Miles, who were like there to allay my concerns. So let's talk a little bit about first how you even started in crypto. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've uh, been a technologist for a, a long time. I think a habit of that is your friends send you articles and random things all the time. And like our Telegram group that stay popping. Yeah. <laughs> Similar format. Like pre Telegram, it was a text or a phone call or email. And um, it, it's as simple. It started really in a way of someone forwarding me. Uh, so, something about uh, Bitcoin. I got it at the early onset, like 2009, 2010, in that rising moment. I managed a lot of software engineers and was in an academic environment as well, where those type of discussions were fairly normal. And uh, I remember it was about 2012, about the time in the first year of Coinbase's launch, that a colleague of mine sent me a, a Bitcoin. Wow. Yeah. Sent you a Bitcoin. Remember that? I had no idea what it was. And that was part of Coinbase's uh, user acquisition uh, strategy. Strategy was to just give it away for free uh, to, to get people on their platform. So that was, that was my introduction. I had no idea what it was. I barely read the white paper. Uh, 
I just kind of went on blind trust. It, it was it was uh, uh, not normal to me. It didn't really make as much sense as it does now. Um, but I, I think that's what I learned. My purpose is, you know, it really wasn't that crazy at that time. It was like 50 bucks or so. Yep. So I got one for free, which was a great conversation starter, and then I bought a few more. Um, and it, I didn't really think much of it. So, so that's very interesting. One thing I want to highlight is, you know, curiosity, you know, by nature, you're a very curious individual. And I think that um, folks can, can be a little reluctant when it comes to new things and, and change and that sort of thing. But, you know, you took it at face value and you were like, okay, this is interesting. So in receiving your first Bitcoin, um, what was the next step for you thereafter? Like this was so early on. So, you know, did you do your own research or like what happened next? I forgot about it. Oh, damn. Okay. That was the, really the next step. I forgot about <laughs> it so that the rise began uh, in that third year of Bitcoin. So as the the white paper became you know, more apparent and the things, the mechanisms of Bitcoin uh, came firsthand knowledge, that's when I kind of drew my attention back. At that point, I mean, individual Bitcoin was like around $1,200. Mm-hmm. So I was just kind of like, this is in stocks. I was early on stocks. I was like one of those kids, elementary school that gave us like this weird like kids and dudes thing. And it, it talked about stocks and all this stuff. And Yahoo was a stock at that time. Yep. Or Amazon was a stock just coming out at that time. And they're like, we want kids to learn about stocks. So, <laughs> you know, I have That's invaluable knowledge, though. Yeah, yeah, I had some indoctrination, mind you, but yeah, the Bitcoin thing was weird because it's like, well, there's some price flux and variance. There's no other like um, economic driving factors. It's more like a, a manner of computing. At yep. play. And so that that was really interesting to me. Well, as a software developer by trade, the the you know. Um, the mechanics and the computations associated with kind of where it derives its scarcity, right? Because that's another thing about Bitcoin that is driving um, its value. And that is there are only 21 million units of Bitcoin. So, you know, and there can never be, it's a mathematical impossibility for there to be any more um, produced, created, et cetera. Uh, yeah. But I want to dig into this conversation of, of intimidation. Lisa, why were you scared? Uh, about cryptocurrency or what were your uh, kind of concerns about it in the beginning? Truth be told, when I first heard about crypto uh, years and years ago, it was associated with Silk Road and there were a lot of illicit purposes. Um, you know, there were, there were just all kinds of shady shit going on and um, it was, so there was that stigma associated with it. And then, you know, just the mathematics, right? Like I'm not a PhD in statistics like Moetti is. So if you're ever wondering, well, where the hell does crypto computers get their knowledge from? Well, it's mostly Moetti. <laughs> no, but um, I, I, you know, am not a, a developer. I've been, you know, in tech for many, many years, but I still didn't understand how it worked. And so it felt very intimidating. And uh, the more conversations that I would have with people, including, you know, Nina, my other co-founder at Crypto Tutors, and, and the sort of urging of this is something that we need to pay attention to because whether we like it or not, this is the future of money. And if we're not aware of what it's doing and, and what's getting done, then we're just doing ourselves a disservice. So I had to put my big girl pants on and be like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go for it. And Miles, the funny thing is like when I make, when I'm like trading crypto, uh, even getting on the exchanges, like, you know, I have a Coinbase account, which is pretty from a UX standpoint, pretty easy to navigate. But when you start getting into like, you know, more complex platforms, it is not only intimidating. It's like, I want to have someone hold my hand as I'm transacting on the platform. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that my intimidation is, is like, I'm not at all afraid I'm just approaching my fear with more curiosity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the fragility is people telling folks that it's a way to get money fast. Like that, that definitely like makes it so that you automatically think it's a lotto ticket. 
Well, it's funny because uh, I find that a lot of people are not familiar with interest. Like they think that interest is something that is like paid to your credit card company, you know, your, your, your student loans. However, there are opportunities to generate interest through, you know, investing in crypto. Like there are, there are strategies and techniques. I'm not saying that uh, this is a get rich quick scheme, but it's kind of nice to see that you make an investment of X dollars and just instead of having the money sit in a savings account that's getting less than 1% interest, you can collect interest um, in some of these plays that is like making money while you sleep, which is what our course is. So you can check that out at CryptoScooters.com. <laughs> I think that uh, a lot of folks are, you know, there's a lot of hype right now. You know, fast forward, Bitcoin is like 12, you know, 12 years or so. And there's a lot of hype in the game. You know, Elon Musk just invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin. There's a lot of institutional um, investment, $100 million from Mass Mutual uh, coming to Bitcoin that I think also speaks to the, the, the viability, the validation um, and, and uh, accelerated adoption. So my question to you is, you know, for folks that are like new, what what do they need to know about Bitcoin? What do they need to know about potentially investing or what do you want them to know? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the key understands is that money is going digital no matter what, like, you know, uh, that the nature of evolution of currency and monetary is, is it has to go digital, you know, like there's no other way around it. It's actually a pathway for like cross border and, and global um, money movement in a, in a way that we haven't seen historically uh, without the same frictions that are present now um, in, in the market. So I think people should look at it as a potential thing that they, I mean, like gold, uh, gold bullion is definitely like a, the closest thing I can compare is people, uh, you know, bought it as a commemorative thing or like thing to say because gold still has uh, maintained a certain level of value. So it's, it's similar to that in that, you know, it's, it's digital equivalent of gold. Mm. That's um. We just wrote a. Uh, we we just posted an article on um our on our site. There's an article talking about Bitcoin. You know why it's digital gold, and you know a couple of the similarities between gold and Bitcoin. We talked about scarcity. You know both um, Bitcoin and gold are finite resources. We actually do not know, unlike Bitcoin, how much gold there is left to mine. So there's that. And to your point around uh, virtualization, right? I feel like the pandemic sped up, accelerated this, this you know, kind of virtual digital experience of, of life. And so let's talk about how people can get prepared for this, this you know, this digital revolution um, as it relates to money. Like what are some of the, what are some of the practices that sh they should be aware of or they, you know, may want to incorporate into into how they're governing themselves in this new digital world that we're living in. I, th I think there's going to be a, a stark contrast between a world of analog and cash versus digital. Uh, people are going to have to prepare themselves to consolidate, you know, the different ways that they represent their identity in a digital sense, and as well like how they manage their money. Um, and, and most folks don't think about it in a, in a large degree, but part of money going digital and the power of the Internet is that it, it creates more availability and access, not only to obtain money, but also participate in the economics of, you know, wealth creation and a lot of other attributes of society that because it hasn't been digital and because the Internet didn't previously exist, were barred away in kind of a, you know, closed loop. Uh, uh, experience for a lot of people. So I love the fact that you're talking about practical applications associated with uh, digital currency. And, um, you know, we spoke a bit about, or we spoke a lot, isn't it a funny bit, get it, Bitcoin, you know? Um, you know, we, we spoke a lot about Bitcoin, but there are, you know, obviously thousands upon thousands of different uh, cryptocurrencies. And, you know, the thing is, Miles, because there's so much hype, right now about crypto, 
you see the value rising based on endorsements by, you know, uh, the Elon Musk's, the Michael Saylor's of the world, right? If they say, you know, buy this. Recently, you know, Elon Musk tweeted Do Dogecoin, right? And it's ridiculous. Well, I don't say it's ridiculous because I'm sure that there are people who, you know, believe in the coin. But how do you avoid situations like that where the, the media and the hype surrounding coins or specific tokens um, isn't about the value? It's, it's, like, how do we avoid falling prey to that kind of, you know, sheeple thinking? Uh, I would say it's already present. It's, I don't know if there's like a really tangible commentary I have about that in, in terms of like what people should do or not do. I, I would I would implore people not to see it as anything different. Like Amazon has had a virtual currency for over a decade that you can convert cash into their Amazon virtual money. Oh wow! Amazon Prime, and that's that's been a present reality for a, a long time. You go to Chuck E. Cheese with your kids if you have kids, or you've been there as a kid. You give them cash, and then they convert it into Chucky coin, and you understand like what's happening there. So it's just a, a different way of banking, like these different banking loops, taking money offline from U.S. currency into these other format and there's advantages to them especially when you talk about cryptocurrency because there's an underlying mechanism or, or driving force that is uh, is creating its value but also creating a level of scarcity that doesn't exist for like u.s dollars like if they wanted to pr uh, print a million more u.s dollars today there's nothing stopping them in from doing it and they actively inflate the u.s dollar when needed to uh, enhance the economy, so um, different. It's a different ball game, and I think it has a lot more um, security over time as it gains adoption because it doesn't have the same attributes that uh, fiat currency does. And um, you know that actually brings me to my next question because I was going to ask you about you know <clears throat> the trust factor. You know, folks might say. Well, especially when um, Bitcoin was originally launched and this whole digital revolution, uh, this digital currency, uh, the revolution was ignited. And there were a lot of illicit use cases associated, you know, with crypto. And I think, unfortunately, folks are, are still kind of thinking about those things as the extent of what and how it is used. So what would you say to folks who say, well, I just don't trust. I don't trust crypto i think it's a bit of american privilege in some ways and then also just there is a large contrast in terms of uh, specific communities uh, bipoc and others that have not had access to the financial education to understand like what any of this stuff means and that's been my own life flight and journey uh, you know, I, I was benefited to have parents that were somewhat knowledgeable, but in thinking about it now, like they didn't know anything because a lot of the stuff that I'm learning is like uh, the scale in which knowledge is required to understand finance is yeah. very, very elaborate and complex. Um, so I, I think that um just to like round back to the question is uh, really just about figuring out how to integrate it into your life in a way that's meaningful to you. The trust factor is a bit of American privilege because other countries around the world deal with volatile currencies. Um, uh, you know, their local monetary uh, is is inc incredibly volatile, like in Venezuela, and you know, from an American perspective, we're not able to see this use case as, as prominently as other people are because yeah. we have the luxury of having a World Bank controlled currency uh, in, our, in our possession. So I think when you think of it that way, uh, the second note is like, try to get outside of your own box and learn more about how money is uh, impacting lives around the world. 
I think that's um, I think that's such a great call out because there is a privilege associated with the stabilization of our currency that has given us the false impression that it will remain stable indefinitely. And you know, one of our um, co-founders here, Crypto Tutors, he is Zimbabwean, and as a result, you know, when we talk about hyperinflation, Zimbabwe is I think only the only country in the world where a trillion dollar note they 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 had at one point a trillion dollar note. So when we talk about hyperinflation, that's what we're referring to. And so I would love to gather your thoughts on, you know, the, the technology behind crypto. So, you know, this way folks can, you know, they have concerns, they have fears. Um, they're used to technology and there's a variety of different applications associated with how we're using tech in relation to money. Um, can you kind of connect those dots for, for us? Yeah. I mean Practically, the, the internet is changing. We went from Web 1.0 as a generation to Web 2.0. And the next landscape is Web 3.0, which goes a little bit further away from what we understand where computers in the traditional like a desktop or laptop, and now a uh, mobile phone or like the primary devices. That's yep, especially in the developing world. Yeah, that's becoming more expansive. And so the nature of how the internet works from a security standpoint is rapidly changing. And the technology, um, cryptographic technology has existed a very long time. And so the crypto part of cryptocurrency is aligning two different technology fields in one, one space. And, and the yeah. it is from a security standpoint, spending money online, right? Your bank and um, balance in your bank account is a number in a database mm -hmm. that isn't corroborated by any other bank in the world or any other system. Right. It's maintained by that single bank. Uh, from a cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, point of view, there's an aspect of the ledger and it's distributed, which the, the idea there is like if, if Chase says you have three thousand dollars um but in fact you have two thousand potentially other other ledgers or other banks would be able to corroborate how much you actually have because there's an identity to the money yep and there's a a, a capture of its circulation which doesn't really exist in in banking currently like if you send a wire even in the u.s if you send a bank wire um the confirmation aspect of that is manual. Calling That's the, unbelievable in the 21st century that it would be manual. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. Calling the other bank. And we've computerized a lot of those aspects. It's just kind of like verifying a balance on another side, but there's nothing inherently in the technology currently being used that automatically tells you that the money was transacted, where it went, and its success in terms of its movement. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that get me most excited is just the transparency of money as mm. well as the idea of, you know, it being a true, a, a noted possession of people like ownership uh, that is uh, kind of cemented by this, this, this aspect of technology is really interesting to me and it, it applies to more than monetary and we're seeing that with music and the aspects of ip creation and copyrights and uh, visual and virtual identities like being able to capture that with a system that can track its movement and and understand how it's being used is a really powerful tool for for the world to have i um i mean there was there's so much uh, that you said there that that we can dissect and I think that um, You know our last guest which was uh, uh, Kashmir she was talking about um, Non-fungible tokens and NFTs and if you haven't seen that episode Please do so because when miles talks about intellectual property and being able to ensure that your IP remains your IP and also the notion of creating your own economies um, Definitely see that episode to learn more but Miles, I think it's also important to to call out, you know, for, for someone who is, you know, just beginning to um, learn about crypto, can you share maybe some resources that folks can can 
learn more like trusted resources where they can start to um, up level their education. Obviously, crypto tutors, um, yeah. we're striving to simplify crypto and bring you folks like Miles to help you expand your knowledge basis and identify who the yeah. thought leaders are in the space to follow. Um, but Miles, any any particular resources uh, that you would direct folks towards? You know, type in Bitcoin white paper and, and read it. I mean, it's yep. worth it. It's just like reading a prospectus for a stock on the stock market. Uh, it sounds complex and crazy, but it's an amazing starting place. Um, another resource that helped me get up to speed was Coin Telegraph, which they've mm -hmm. been a really good resource over the years. Um, and then CoinDesk has a really good blog. Um, there are a lot of different um, uh, speakers and thought leaders on this. And there's really a, a thriving community right now on, on Clubhouse too, about people just coming out and Twitter, uh, where you can just search on Twitter, or, you know, find amongst the web, different folks having, uh, you know, the opportunity to vocalize what they're learning. And then two, there's, there's education. I mean, you know, what, what you guys are doing as well as, um, and a few other aspects, people are providing their time, um, uh, to to help coach people through their understanding of what this this technology means and what its implications are beyond m money. Yeah, you know, um, I again appreciate those resources. Um, Coin Telegraph, great, you know, news and and keeps you abreast of what's happening in the industry on a regular basis on Twitter. What's your um What's your handle so people can follow you as well, Miles? It's Miles G Dotson. Okay, okay. excellent. Miles G. Dotson. <laughs> we'll make sure though, we'll make sure that, you know, folks can see it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we, we highlight that because we really want to keep um, you accessible and Good. the work that you're doing accessible. Um, you know, I am relatively new to, to crypto. I want to call that out as well, because as a part of my journey over the course of the past eight months, um, I have read the Bitcoin white paper and, you know, you, you of course want to do your due diligence and we're going to emphasize that because we want to make sure that you are when applying the learnings are doing so in as educated a manner as possible this is about calculated risks so another thing i'll call out although we are not advisors we are educators and we want to make sure that we emphasize do not invest anything that you cannot afford to lose so you know miles um from a from an investment standpoint it is not uncommon for folks in the crypto world especially given the volatility to, to generate triple digit, quadruple digit returns. And if I myself hadn't experienced it firsthand, then I would definitely be like many of the other people out there who question uh, whether or not this is too good to be true. So what would you say to someone who says, nah, that just sounds too good to be true? Yeah, it, it's really about education. Like if you go based on like what people are saying or what the fad or uh, just, you know, talk of the talk is at the moment, it's really easy to get lost in the sauce. Um, I, I really think that as people learn and, and become active in, in a, a particle of investment, uh, that they should start small, always start small and have a gradual pace to grow and understand that, you know, get rich quick schemes are not real. <laughs> exactly. Like they take time and education and positioning and the people you think that hit it on luck, their timeline is 10 years before that in terms of where they maturated their knowledge to a place where they could make that one move on that one day that amounted in some great windfall. So I wouldn't do it for that purpose. Like the best example is I put money into Bitcoin that, you know, and its scale is something that I use to pay my Xfinity Comcast bill, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the opportunity to, in a way, kind of arbitrage that money or put it in a place where it can grow at a rate that it won't grow on the stock market or in my bank account is an advantage to me. And especially if that means that I can mess around and end up paying two months of, of uh, Comcast or Xfinity or Netflix. I would look at it in that aspect, like how can you stretch certain curtain things, certain things that you're currently affording and, and, and test it out in that that nature. And I think the key thing is I had a friend call me and say, I was hey, just about to bring that up. I, I think I should buy a whole Bitcoin. I was just like, 
that's not how it works. There's Satoshi's, this fractional Bitcoin that you can buy that has equivalents to any US dollar denomination. So if you want to put $50 in there, put $50 in there. But find a purpose of use for yourself. It's the same thing with investments. Like people invest in startups. Some people are not as uh, as fortunate as others in that process because there's risk involved in, in all these different avenues. So risk is a really hard thing to have self understanding or a self clarity on. Um, and it comes by practice, not by evidence, like not a simple, you know, one moment evidence. It, it comes through practice, like making decisions and reading the feedback loop of how that decision has amounted for you. I, um, you know, you're one of the people that I had spoken to about, you know, like my strategy, my approach. And one thing you brought up was uh, it was a daily cost averaging where, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that that's a practical, again, a, a practical application that folks who are new, um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about that so that they can understand kind of what do we mean when we say cost daily cost averaging? Yeah, it's just a, a simple practice of buying Bitcoin daily, weekly, monthly, or on some set time cycle uh, to take advantage of the dips and falls in the market. Um, to amass, you know, some type of, uh, you know, gain over time. Uh, mm-hmm. the economics of being able to take samples out of a curve in terms of value uh, are, are more rewarding than uh, invest on a single day and hold and see what see what happens. That's why option trading is so hot in the stock market. So uh, if you're able to start simple and you know, I, w- I wouldn't necessarily start with Bitcoin because anything less than $100 gets diluted really, really fast. Um, I'll start with like Ethereum or something else and just see the, the, the movement of putting like $20 to $50 here and there. And then also understanding to pull out when you have utility for that money, because in the future, that's that's what's going to it's, it's going to be better than a savings account is exactly what it currently offers as a value proposition. Uh, so I would use it in that format before I turn into like a, a major crypto investor. I don't think that the average everyday person, that's not their plight in this. Yeah. And I love the fact that you said that starting with, you know, a different coin, because at, you know, if you're investing anything less than a hundred dollars in Bitcoin, then it gets diluted. So that's, you know, an important call out. Secondly, um, you know, secondly, when it comes to just starting to get your feet wet, like this is, you know, experiment. And, and when you have, you know, $20, uh, $50 to experiment with, well, I think you can be a little less intimidated, which brings us back to even the nature of the discussion that we're having today, which um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. And that is for folks who are intimidated, you know, people who have felt like, crypto is too complicated and and that they don't necessarily trust the system. Well, I hope today's conversation allayed some of those concerns and and gave you perspective around how the barrier to entry is very low. You know, there's fractional buying. The barrier to entry is very low. There's a lot of great content out here, like, you know, subscribing to the Crypto Tutors channel to continue to receive that great content. You talked about some great resources. Uh, Coin Telegraph and reading the Bitcoin white paper. Mm-hmm. If you're concerned, the more you understand, the less concern that you'll have because you will become an educated investor. And and knowledge is power. And one thing about crypto tutors is that one of our main objectives is to help you transform your knowledge into wealth. Okay, your knowledge into wealth. Continue to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Crypto Tutors is where it's at. We'll continue to bring geniuses that are leading and spearheading the industry. Miles, you're part of the vanguard. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. You know, they call me the Oprah Tech because I get to talk to people like you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We're excited to, to see where your journey goes next. How can people find you or where would you like them to connect with you on? Sure. To, uh, to check out me personally, my handle is Miles G. Dotson on all social platforms. I'm on LinkedIn also. Um, and my startup studio is 
uh, called Devland. And you can check us out at www.devland.us. I'm super happy that we got to share you with the world. I think that what you have done and what you're doing is not only uh, a showcasing of your genius, but how you represent for the culture so hard and how you operate from a space of Sankofa. Fancy if I got Sankofa over here, go back and bring forward. You just went to the future, came back and you brought us with you. So thank you for everything that you've done and continue to do. And I'm excited to be on this journey with you. And um, thanks for being on the crypto couch. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, stay connected, stay present and keep turning knowledge into power. No, turn knowledge into wealth, but knowledge is power. All that good stuff. <laughs> Want to learn more? Visit CryptoTutors.com.